How do you deal with an irate Karen's stern demands? We'll get to that in a bit, but first, don't deviate from the flowchart? Okay, if you insist. About a decade ago, I had the misfortune of working in a call center for a company which provided phone, broadband, and satellite TV channels. This was the days before fiber, so the setup was slightly different from what you see these days. To begin with, I worked in customer services doing things like booking pay-per-views, changing billing dates, and upgrading packages. After a year or so, the powers that be decided the whole call center would be trained on phone and broadband tech support and we would take those calls instead. Lots of people complained because they weren't technical minded and found the idea of fixing tech issues daunting. I wasn't worried because I'm a massive nerd and was building my own computers from age 12. My dad started teaching me when I was about 8. This new type of call sounded much more interesting and I was looking forward to it. The staff were told, don't worry, we'll train you. It's simple, really. To be fair to them, they were right. Kind of. For those who don't know, the original internet connection, dial-up, was an issue because the phone line was totally used up by the internet connection. Meaning you couldn't make calls at the same time as using your glacier-like connection. Broadband revolutionized the system because it allowed both phone and internet to be used at the same time, and it improved the connection speed to allow for more data to be transferred. Think of dial-up as a country road. Slow speeds and only one kind of traffic at a time, or you end up with a massive queue of cars, lorries, and tractors clogging the road with no filtering space for motorbikes. Broadband is the equivalent of a dual carriageway. Two lanes of traffic in each direction means you can get more traffic into your city at higher speeds. The issue with more traffic is that you need to add more road signs to direct it to the correct destination. Phone signals to the phone, broadband signals to the router. To do this, you needed to have a micro filter as the first thing plugged into every single phone port in use in the house. The TV installation, which happened first, did not include a micro filter, and customers would assume the TV installation wouldn't need to be messed with, so they didn't add one when they set up their router. The number one complaint on the tech support line was caused by that filter being missing. It resulted in slow or intermittent broadband connections and static on phone lines and dropped calls. People would phone up and scream at me because the connection was fine to start with, but the phone line's always been bad and now the connection keeps dropping. As I mentioned, most of the staff were upset at being moved from a customer service role to a tech role, so the higher-ups had a troubleshooting system created. It was basically a glorified flowchart with a pretty interface. The issue is that whoever created it didn't think it through. No matter where the problem was with the tech issue, the chances were that the customer would need to be calling on a mobile phone so that the right steps could be followed. Most customers did not call on mobiles because, in those days, calls from mobile phones were expensive. Even calls to landlines, and especially calls to 0845 numbers like call centers. This information was missing from the flowchart, and it meant that if the customer tried to change the way their equipment was connected, or if we ran a line test, it would result in the call dropping because they were disconnecting their landline handset or we were stopping all signals down the line for a couple of minutes to do the test. It was assumed that we would call our customers back if this happened, because it was impressed into us that the point was to solve the tech issue. If the customer has to keep calling back and speaking to different people, then it slowed this process down. The flowchart did not say, call your customer back. The thing with me being kind of techy was that I could usually identify the fault in the first minute of the call based on the symptoms described by the customer, and I seemed to have a knack for being able to explain tech issues using accessible language, so the customer understands what's happening without feeling condescended to. This meant that my calls were shorter, more efficient, and my customer satisfaction survey results were high. What's not to like? Well, you know how I mentioned that the powers that be decided to take non-techy people and put them in a tech role? It went about as well as you would expect. The flowchart worked to a point, but people who had no tech knowledge tried to cut corners, and it resulted in problems. Free replacement routers were issued for external line fault problems, which is like replacing the roundabout on an interchange when the problem is a tree on the road 10 miles from there. The engineers were to resolve external faults caused by dead master phone sockets, about as useful as doping roadworks the next town over in an attempt to get more traffic through a flooded slip road at your town's boundary. Repeat calls were up, 
resolutions were down, customer satisfaction was low for the call center as a whole. There were about 20 of us who were doing well because, of course, I wasn't the only nerd in the call center. We used our common sense and tech know-how to get results. And my team of around 15 was around 50% tech nerd. Our manager loved it because we had the best results of the whole call center and she looked amazing, despite being a Luddite herself. The head office kept trying to get the rest of the call center up to our level. They couldn't figure out why people hired to be glorified phone concierges couldn't fix phone lines. Obviously, the problem must be the staff. Word was issued from on high, thou shalt not deviate from the flow chart. I foolishly thought that they only meant the people with CSATs which were through the floor. I thought the people who knew what they were talking about would be left to it. Slowly but surely, the rest of the call center's scores started climbing out of the toilet. Our team was still constantly the highest, but the gap wasn't so embarrassingly massive anymore. Others were resisting the flowchart. People at the peak of Mount Stupid on the Dunning-Kruger graph fought the idea that they didn't know enough to act without the dubious support of the admittedly quite bad flowchart. Upper management started thinking of ways to make them use it. A new score was added to our stats. Adherence to process. Quality control started failing our work if we deviated from the flowchart. My manager started writing me and the others up for it. We tried to explain that the flowchart worked for the people who didn't actually know computers because it methodically went through every possibility over the course of about an hour and a half. If you don't know where the fault is, then eventually you will stumble over the right fix. But when you have some knowledge and can tell within the first five seconds that Mr. Smith has accidentally turned off his wireless card, surely it's better customer service to jump right to that. Apparently not. She said that if we deviated from the flowchart again, she would start the disciplinary process, which always and without exception resulted in the person being fired sooner or later. Okay then, no more using our brains. All of us stopped using our prior knowledge to fix the faults quickly. I stopped explaining the issues to the clients. We literally just read the flowchart instructions in all their mind-numbing and typoed glory. I also stopped calling customers back when the line dropped due to flaws in the flowchart. Every time this happened, I would leave a note on the client's profile. Line dropped when doing X test. I've been told never to deviate from the flowchart or I'll be taken to disciplinary stage. There's no instruction to say I can call my customer back, so I didn't. If customer calls back in, test result was Y. One of my colleagues delighted in telling his customers, Yes, I know exactly what the problem is and it'll only take 5 minutes to fix. But first, I'm required to do these other tests. It will take about 40 minutes to get to the point where I'm allowed to fix your issue. Why? Well, manager has threatened me with unemployment if I use my brain. So I have to go down the line here and it'll take 40 minutes to get to the one that I know will resolve your problem. Suddenly, our team was at the bottom of the CSAT board. Our repeat calls were through the roof. We were the worst performing team in the call center. Our manager was being questioned by upper management about why our scores had plummeted. The head office was going to take us off tech and put us onto debt management lines if we didn't start getting our score back up to where it was. Obviously, it didn't happen. Most of the techie people left the business. I stuck it out long enough to see the tech role removed and the deadlines instated. Just before I started my new job with my current employer, head office sent out their annual feedback survey. I ripped them a new one in brutal feedback, from the micromanaging, to inappropriate staff roles for the people hired, to predatory upselling to vulnerable customers and unethical debt management practices. I heard that some of the other managers were fired, so it seems other people spoke out too. And there were some top-down changes which fixed some of the superficial issues. Oh, and that terrible flowchart? They prettied it up, added the fiber options, and put it on their website so that people with mobile data can fix their own broadband issues. At least they got rid of the typos first. So, considering the kind of company this is, let's be real, even though OP tried to rip them a new one, they probably don't care. Awful, ain't it? I will never get over how universally hated most ISPs are. Looking at you, Comcast slash Xfinity. That said, our final story of the day is Karen Boss desperately needed my uniform back the next day. No excuses. Okay, so a little backstory first. 
I'm a 20 year old college student, full time, doing 23 plus hours a week, on top of classes, to make ends meet. I live paycheck to paycheck, and have a car I am slash was paying off. I used to work at a McDonald's in my hometown, but since I moved to live on campus, which was 45 minutes away from my old job, and I wasn't willing to make the commute. So I decided to apply and got accepted to a small sandwich shop 10 minutes from my college, which was a blessing. It started out great, plenty of hours, easy work, fast days, till the old manager decided to switch stores. The new manager was one of the biggest Karens you have ever met. Like bad. And when I say bad, I really mean it. She completely changed the procedures and made things so much worse. And when I'd have to stay over sometimes two to three hours after closing, she would burst in the next day yelling, screaming at the top of her lungs, Stop staying later, you have to be out by 8.30, we won't pay you for any time past then. I had no choice because the list she gave me to do to close the store, alone every night may I add, was extremely time consuming, especially with no help. I was expected to stop serving at 8 and do 5 people's worth of work in 30 minutes. It simply wasn't doable. Hearing I wasn't going to be paid for the time I worked, time I spent making sure everything was done on the list before I left, otherwise I'd be fired for not doing all of it would go unpaid, as well as I'd be fired if I stayed longer than 8.30, there was no winning. On top of that, the moment management switched, they decided they were giving people too many hours and cut me to only three hours a week. That went on for four weeks until I decided enough was enough. $45 work weeks wasn't even worth putting in the time and effort to even show up. So on one of my weekends, I was with my parents off campus. I was due to work that day. Three hours, of course, my only day that week. I was shopping near said sandwich shop. It's located inside a Walmart. My mom and I were discussing for the last week how I should just quit since it seems they're trying to fire me without saying they're firing me, wanting me to leave on my own so they wouldn't need to fill out paperwork. Right then and there, I decided, know what, screw this job and screw my entitled Karen boss. I sent her a text that I quit on the spot and to not expect me to come in that night for my shift. She texted me back ranting about how since I'm not giving her a two week notice, I'll never be able to work at one of those sandwich shops again. At that point, I didn't care. I already had to give up my brand new car of only four months because I couldn't pay my loan and insurance. It was a nice car too. A white shimmery 2016 Hyundai Sonata. I loved that thing. I told her at some point that week I'd try and get the brand new uniform, that funny enough they had just given me the week prior, a whole three and a half months after I started working there to me, but I warned her that my classes run right till before closing, I didn't know when I'd be able to do so. She texted back in what I could only imagine the snarkiest tone possible, no I really need that uniform back tomorrow. I told her I'm sorry, but that may not be possible due to my school schedule, and I'm not willing to ditch a class to drop off a few pieces of clothing. She said, no, you will bring it back tomorrow. Don't even try to lie to me, you were seen in the store the day you quit. No excuses. Okay then, she said no excuses. I didn't want to get into an argument with her over it, and knowing she herself would be closing that day, and my classes ended exactly at 8. I happily complied. I made sure I arrived right as she was closing the lock on the gate. I was bringing the clothes in my reusable shopping bag. I had no throwaway bags, and since she can't take and claim my bag as her own, I was just going to give her the clothes one piece at a time. Knowing she would have to carry them out of the store, juggling them back home, made me happy. When it came time to deliver my uniform to her, all the stars seemed to align perfectly. I arrived at 8.30, caught her on the way out with the outfit, not even in a reusable bag to begin with. As an extra touch of sweet, unplanned irony, it was raining outside. Hard rain. The sidewalks, I guess, were extra slippery and muddy, cause on my way in, I slipped and landed chest first into the mud. I was mostly spared though, because the clothes were there to break my fall and absorb most of the filth. Dropping off the muddy, loose clothes, seeing her reaction, watching her stomp her feet, wrench in disgust, holding the clothes 10 feet away from her body, huffing and puffing, marching out of the store, and pure shock and disbelief, she didn't even have words for me. It was the sweetest revenge I had ever seen. 
This did mean I had to buy a whole new set of clothes and change in the Walmart bathroom, but it was all worth it to see her reaction in the end. After I'd returned to my dorm that evening, I sent her a text simply saying, Enjoy, smiley face, and I blocked her number. Safe to say karma really did pay out on my end. I've heard some similar stories in the past of people that go right into the office and strip right down to their underwear. I imagine some people would probably go work out in the gym in those clothes and then drop them off. It sure is crazy how these people that hand out work uniforms sure do need them back ASAP when you're no longer working there. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another awesome story of revenge, check out that video on the left. Or, if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.